So you're sort of seeing a range of different devices, uh, some of which are mobile, some of which are static, some of which are low power, some of which are plugged into the wall, some of which have batteries but can't last weeks. So there's sort of a range of different capabilities, range of different uh, types of uh, link layer technologies, um, you know, battery budgets, and so on. So this, really what this class is trying to do is expose you to all of these different uh, classes of things uh, and the technologies behind them, and then asking you to play and come up with something interesting. Right? Um, ultimately, really think about what can you do with these types of devices that you wouldn't just do traditionally. So traditionally, over the standard internet, uh, what we do is typically person-to-person -person communication. Right, the standard internet that we've had for all these years is for email, it's for text, it's for sending uh, files, it's for browsing. All of these have a human at one end point. Right? The other end might be a data store, but typically there's a human at some point. Um, with these devices, you can particularly, uh, you know, if you look at the whole ecosystem, you can have systems where there's no human in the loop anywhere. Right? So your embedded devices are sensors, they're actuators, they're generating data, they can do something. And um, you can have at your servers, at your laptops, at your Android device, at the modes, computational processes that are running, that are filtering the information that they're getting, they're making decisions based on the information they're getting, and uh, sort of you're closing that whole loop. Right? So now you can build a distributed sensing and control system. Okay? That's really what the IoT is about. And that distributed system can be relatively small. It can be on the order of a few devices near you. It can be really large. It can be thousands of devices scattered all over the planet. Right? And knowing how to stitch together a heterogeneous network of that type using standard IP-based uh, mechanisms is sort of part of what that uh, whole space is about. So again, by way of sort of giving that, that high-level picture, and there's sort of a range of different mobility, uh, as I mentioned. So Android, for example, you could be on, uh, you have this Android phone with you, you're sort of walking around, but maybe the environments that you're walking around have the sensor tags embedded in them, so your phone's sort of talking to the sensors as you're moving around, and it's gathering information, or it's telling them what to do. Um, so you sort of have these new ways of interacting with the environment that you might have been used to. Right? So now, this is not about just Everything has to go through a centralized infrastructure. It might be peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, you can implement protocols that are purely at the link layer, meaning they're just going over this radio and talking to what's nearby. It can be done at the uh, at, a, at a sort of IP layer where you uh, do something on top of UDP, for example, just socket-based. Or we can go even higher up and work above the application layer. And CoAP, for example, that you started to look at, is an example of an application layer protocol. Publish, subscribe is another class of application layer protocols. We'll talk about MQTT at some point in this course, and that's something else that people are starting to use to put together these systems. So you can have your devices communicate at the link layer, at just above UDP, or above an application layer protocol. So those are sort of three places in which we typically uh, you know, build our systems. right? And of course, the network layer, which is in between that, so here, let's do this again. You notice I've left out the session and presentation layer. I've been doing networking for 20 years. I still don't understand why they bother to describe it about what, what they have to do with anything. So um, most practicing network engineers and researchers kind of ignore those two uh, parts of the layer. So really, this five-layer stack, you know, 99% of the time is all you care about. So at the physical layer, we're not going to touch anything in this class. We're not changing the radios ourselves. We'll use whatever physical layers are available to us. There are multiple different kinds of physical layers, and we've started to look at what the trade-offs are potentially. So we talked about you know these low power 802.15.4 uh, type of uh, file layer, um, Bluetooth, the standard Bluetooth, Bluetooth low energy, which is a different protocol from standard Bluetooth because this is allowing your devices to go to sleep. Bluetooth does not. It's a completely different physical layer. The modulation scheme is different. It's meant to be very energy efficient. Um, but it's still primarily for pairing two devices to each other. It's not about building like a mesh network, which we can do with 15.4. And RPL is a mesh networking protocol for 15.4 uh, type of devices. Uh, the other physical layer, of course, is just whatever you have for your Wi-Fi. 
system. So these are sort of different physical layers that we're going to be uh, seeing. And of course, they, these sort of span also the link layer. Uh, you, can, you can develop, so sort of both of these, um, you can develop protocols and projects for the class that just sit above here. Right? So you can have things where you just focused on the peer-to-peer -peer communication. As an exa example of that might be you develop something that uh, is just about your Android talking to devices that you happen to encounter as you walk around. And you don't need anything more than the link layer potentially to do that. So you might do a project, something like that. Or you could do something that's a medium access mechanism at the link layer, um, where the standard uh, CSMA may not be the most efficient thing from certain perspectives. And I can certainly point this at some papers that show you can improve on CSMA. Uh, at the network layer, there's two things you can do with it. One is you can just take it for granted. Say that whatever the network routing protocol is, somebody has figured it out and you're just using it. Right? Uh, but there is also room to tinker with those protocols because many of them are relatively new in this space, especially when it comes to wireless and mobile. And there are ways in which you might be able to improve their performance or adapt them from one type of system to another. So we'll, uh, we're going to touch on sort of RPL today. Um, I might at least briefly talk about like AODB and its variants, which are uh, showing up in other settings. Somebody here mentioned Batman. Did you? That's an AODB implementation, or is it its own protocol? Uh, I think it's supposed to be kind of an improvement. Okay. For, uh, actually, was it a distance like protocol? Sorry, oh, it's okay. okay. So it's sort of kind of combination. Yeah. So they're sort of you know traditional routing protocols, but sort of adapted for wireless settings. Um, I. If time permits, at some point, I'd like to talk at least briefly about VCP. Those of you who took 597 have seen that. But this is sort of a new approach to doing routing um, that we developed here at USC. And for example, there is no um, RFC about it out there, but that's something we're working on at the moment. So uh, you can sort of get your hands dirty with doing an implementation of VCP. We have one for Contiki, but maybe doing an implementation of VCP over Android. Um, so that's something that's now possible to do. Uh, at Above the network layer, you could write something that, uh, for example, you know, here you have UDP and TCP. You can write something that just does like socket programming over it, right? So you can always do now anything over uh, arbitrary distances over the internet that just uses UDP sockets because in the IoT, every node has an IP address. Okay. And so you can really use all your standard. Uh, socket programming and all of that, you just need to give what's the IP address, what's the port number, and you can set up whatever applications you want at that layer. Uh, or you can do things above the application layer. So in this uh, setting, you can sort of think of, um, there can be different application layers, but sort of two in particular that we're all used to even from traditional internet. There's sort of a client-server paradigm, where you have a server, you have a client, the client starts a uh, you know, requests some resources from the, and the server uh, provides those resources and sometimes uh, goes into the sort of REST architecture. And HTTP is what's used in a traditional internet, and CoAP is sort of the low power equivalent of that. Right? So you can do something that uses CoAP and is built on top of that. And you get certain additional guarantees over just doing it yourself over UDP, and we'll see what those are. Uh, then, on uh, the other type of thing you can do is sort of more P2P. Uh, but actually, there's one paradigm in particular uh, that's of interest to us, and that's publish subscribe. Uh, and we'll talk about that and the different approach to doing P2P that's been gaining uh, and somehow related to all of this is called name data networking or information centric networking. And these are typically things that are happening all the way up at the application layer of the stack, although I'm not 100% sure where they implement it in the end. They may have done that even a little bit lower down. But, um, so you'll have an exposure by the end of, I don't know, week seven or eight to all of these things. And now you're sort of, this is your playground. Go build something interesting that modifies something in these stacks, that uh, builds something interesting on top of these things and so on. Where generally less interested in this class on a very simple type of an app. So if you just think of an app as I give the user, um, I don't know, I, I build a little GUI and the user can, you know, turn the light on off and it uses all these protocols and the light turns on or off. That's not really a class project. That's, that's something you would do maybe in a 
I don't know, an app development type of class. Uh, here, we want you to get a little bit deeper into the nitty gritty of the networking issues. So sort of what is the challenge maybe that the current protocols don't solve, that this might solve, or there's some new way of doing things and it's been developed for this environment, you're porting it to this other environment, you're handling some additional issues while you do that. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about what would constitute a valid project, but just sort of at a high level, we're not just looking for you know, simple blinking lights. We want something that's, that's sophisticated in the, in the implementation. Um, okay, so again, I just wanted to reconnect us to the big vision of uh, the class and where everything fits in. So for today's uh, discussion, um, here are two URLs. They're all in tiny.cc. One is RPL1. And then the other one is RPL2. So let's look at these two documents. RPL1 is like a slide show about it uh, that we can kind of go through. And RPL2 is the RFC, which gives all the, the detailed information about RPL. just kind of go through this, it gives an overview of what RPL is, and uh, if you have questions, we can discuss them. So RPL, of course, stands for Routing Protocol Layer. It is an IPv6-based uh, protocol, and as you should all be aware by now, IPv6 has pretty much replaced uh, the old IPv4, and the big motivation was we needed more addresses. And precisely because now we're talking about, you know, millions or billions of devices that are embedded devices, we want more addresses. So in fact, IoT was what people were thinking of when they came up with IPv6. So, um, in the kinds of devices we're looking at, uh, you know, the modes that we're playing with, uh, there's sort of two key features about them. One is that they're low power, the other is that the links are lossy. We've talked about both of those issues in this class already. So, what some of the folks in IETF went about doing was to think about how do you adapt IPv6 to run on this type of a network. And uh, there's sort of two pieces to this. If you go to the page uh, right after, um, it's talking about sort of the stack on the left. Uh, there's a six low pan on top of the 802.15.4. And what the six low pan does is it really gives a way to do IPv6 addressing over this low power type of network because the packets are really long, right? Uh, typically for IPv6. And the addresses are really long. And so they first came up with a standard so that you do what's called header compression. So you're able to send much smaller packets, but it still uh, gives you the functionality of IPv6 and that each node is end to end addressable. So we won't get into the nitty gritty of 6 low pan. The main thing you should know is that it's referring to a way of implementing IPv6 on devices where the packet sizes have to be really small. And we talked about why that has to be because of the, the links being really. And uh, so above that is RPL, um, which is sort of the IPv6 routing mechanism that they proposed as a standard for this uh, class of devices. RPL is not the only routing system that's out there. Now uh, Google is uh, backing a different one called Thread, um, but it's not currently open, so we can't figure out what exactly they did there. So until then, we're, we sort of only have RPL to work with. Roughly speaking, the difference between RPL and Thread, um, and even AODD and other uh, existing routing protocols is that RPL is very much focused on uh, collection. So the idea is that there is a border router or a sync node that all of the nodes are trying to communicate their data to. So if it's that your end-to-end -end devices, the, sorry, the small devices are just sensors, they're collecting information, they're just pushing it to the uh, to that sync or that gateway. Uh, and so RPL is really sort of optimized for that. Uh, the next slide talks about, uh, in general, IPv6. So uh, this is the same thing I mentioned before. The frame length for IPv6 is on the order of 100, sorry, 1,280 bytes. Uh, the link layer we're using is restricted to about 
80 bytes if you take away all the header part of it. And uh, so 6 Lopan basically handles all of the details of how do you fit it. So the idea of uh, header compression is what 6 Lopan is about. So we want to dwell more on it. Um, So let's skip that next slide to the one that's talking about the routing protocol uh, layer. And the, the key idea of RPL is uh, they create something called a DODAG, or Destination-Oriented Directed Acyclic Graph. So, and it's sort of a fancy way of saying that you have a network in which there is a destination to which everything is headed. And from every node, you want to build a route that doesn't create cycles. So this is OK, right? But this would not. Because right? now you have a cycle here where packets might just keep looping. So you want to prevent that from happening. Um, and here, you have no cycle, so it is a, an acyclic graph, and it's a directed acyclic graph, but it's not destination-oriented with a single destination. This is a multiple destination uh, dodag. But if you want only a single destination that everybody needs to route to, and this is your sync, then sort of a valid dodag for the system. Right. But if you really look at the underlying wireless network that you have, it may be that it's actually possible to have all of these other links in the network, right? So maybe, in fact, each of these communications is possible, Right? And of all the possible routing structures you could develop, you're trying to find, in some sense, the best one. So the best uh, structure that no matter where you are, you send your data, it'll eventually get to the same, there are no loops. And uh, so you know, even in this case, I sort of show two different parents, but maybe what you really want is uh, simple. Think of it as sort of a tree that is all headed in one direction. It does allow for the possibility of multiple dodags. So you might have this one as well as maybe a different one, which is right, maybe all of these links are the same, but you have a, a different possible way of getting your information to the sink. And maybe for reliability purposes, you kind of maintain both representations. If one works, you switch to the other. So it allows for that possibility. Um, so the next slide sort of gets into some of these uh, details. Uh, in RPL, there is a link metric idea. And you're trying to build a dodag that sort of optimizes some function of these link metrics. And we talked about ETX in this class. And in fact, most standard implementations of RPL only use the ETX metric. Uh, and the next slide is about the ETX class function, which we've talked about in this class, so I'll skip. Um, the next one is talking about the notion of a rank in a dodag. So by definition, because everybody's pointing at the destination, you can ask how many hops away you are from the destination. So if you're one hop away from the destination, they say you have rank one, otherwise rank two, and so on. Um, I mean, that's one particular implementation. You can define ranks differently, but the idea is you're sort of ordering the nodes in some, some sense. And uh, the next slide sort of talks about as you're choosing your uh, possible routes, you might um, you know, have to switch the, the rank. So the example they give in the next slide, there's a node G. Um, sorry, I should have, I have a micro HDMI cable which doesn't connect to the USC system. So, uh, um, there's sort of, if you're on this slide over here, right? Hopefully we're all synced to the right slide. Uh, instead of going from G directly to D, because that link from G to D has a high ETX of 5, it's, sh it's taking a, a different route through H. And so even though it might have been possible to have a dodag where it was a rank 2, if this was discovered as the routing was going on, it might need to change its rank to be a rank 3 and point to uh, the other node instead. And sort of each node is maintaining this best parent information. And that's really all you're doing is you're saying, who's your next hop towards the destination? So it's actually, the idea is very simple. Um, the devil is all in the details, and they're somewhat confusing, but once you actually, if you have to, if you play with them, it's pretty easy to figure out. So there's basically these three types of uh, control messages that, uh, there's actually four, I think, uh, control messages that end up getting used in RPL. 
um, and they go by these uh, acronyms of DIS and DIO and DAO. We can um, briefly discuss what they are. I have some notes on that. Um, so these are control messages that are sent using ICMP v6. Um, but basically, DIO messages stand for the DODAG information object. These are messages that carry information um, such as the RPL instance, the version number, the rank, and other routing metrics that you need to compute the routes. Um, and so these are basically the messages that are being used to construct and maintain that DODAG as the network is known. Uh, the thing about a DIO is that only the root node kind of starts disseminating these DIOs and they kind of spread through the network. And uh, the other type of message they have is called a DIS, which is a node can send this message to its neighbors to try and ask them for configuration information. And the reason for this is that you might have a new node that's just joined the network, and he needs to know what the other nodes nearby their configuration information is. So it's sort of a proactive way to pull for that information. And then the last is DAO, uh, which is the destination advertisement object, which is used in the rare cases when you want to send data not just to the sink but from the sink or some other point to a different node in the network. It's sort of meant for the um, downward traffic. And then there's sort of a, a, an ACK uh, for the DAO as well, but we can skip that. So the next um, slide talks about three modes in which RPL can be operated, uh, collect, distribute, and P2P. Uh, the way RPL is designed, the intention was that most of the communication will be collect uh, oriented. So most of the time you're getting data from nodes to the gateway. And that's reasonable to assume if you're looking at sort of a sensor network deployment. Uh, the other mode is distribute, which is in the other direction. You're trying to send data from the sync node uh, or gateway node to other nodes in the network. And finally, um, the P2P mode in which two nodes within the network might be able to talk to each other. But if you notice how the distribute uh, messages work, they basically go in the opposite direction of the DODAC. So if you want to send from A to G, you just reverse the way that G would have talked to A. Right? So basically every node would just need to know who's pointing towards it. Right? And so you use uh, somehow this information in the other direction. And P2P, the simplest way to implement it is actually to first send a message to the sync asking to deliver the information to the destination. And then along the way, if there's a node that is sort of on both the forward path and the reverse path, you can sort of find a shortcut right there. So this kind of illustrates that idea. So for example, M wants to send some message to G. The first time it sends that message, it'll send it to A asking it to deliver it to G. And as that message uh, goes through D, so it goes M to H, H to D, D to A, back from A to D, and then from D to G, then D can figure out that all of these messages are both leaving it to A and then coming back from A, and it might as well be a shortcut, and then from that point on, all of the peer-to-peer -peer messages could just go from M to H to D to G. Right? But the thing to notice is that this network is not actually optimized for the M to G communication. The way that we created the network was to minimize the ETX path from the nodes to A. Right? And in fact, it's not even designed to minimize the path from A back to the other direction, because that would assume that all of the link metrics are the same in both directions. And it turns out even ETX uh, is not actually the same in both directions sometimes. It's a function of the actual radio characteristics and, and uh, maybe interference patterns local to different radios. So you can actually have asymmetric link quality. So my quality to you might be different from your quality back. It could also be because our transmitter power levels are slightly different. So I can talk very loudly to use, the channel's very good, you talk back somewhat more quietly and it's not as, as easy for me to hear as it was for you to hear. So symmetry is not something you can take for granted on these uh, types of networks. Um, so I, I think the next slide kind of shows an illustration of how the rank calculations would be made, how the um, ATX information might propagate through the network. It's basically a distance vector mechanism. So as you can see, sort of A sends this uh, DIO message and they immediately make A their preferred parent, the DIO message will capture in it the metric that you're trying to base your ranking on. And um, sort of this process keeps propagating when nodes hear about a better possible parent to get to the destination, they will switch their current preferred parent to that node 
and adjust their rank accordingly and we'll propagate that information further accordingly. So yeah, let's skip past all the details, but you can sort of imagine how that works if you've taken any networking class before. You've seen distance vector, it's a very standard. Uh, so in fact, I think that's really all I wanted to say about RPL and, and uh, you know, just to convey the idea that it's primarily meant for this one-way communication and it's essentially a distance vector-based scheme. It avoids cycles as you would want your routing protocol to do. Uh, if you do need nodes to talk to each other, it sort of has this slightly inefficient process, but uh, it's good enough if all you care about is uh, primarily all the communication going to the gateway, occasionally something going peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, and the trade-off is that in order to just focus on um, destination-oriented traffic, the routing tables become trivial. So now you don't have every node storing a whole bunch of entries saying, if you want to send to this person, this is my neighbor. If you want to send to this person, this is my neighbor. It just has one entry. It just says, my best parent is. So, so you've really dramatically simplified the routing table, and that's useful because we're talking about modes. So the simpler you can make the routing protocol, the less space they will occupy on the device, the easier it will be to fit other applications on these other devices. So you don't want your routing portion of the network stack to be so large that that's eating up all the storage and the memory on your on your devices. So that's the reason why they kind of went with this design choice. So sort of when they were designing this, it wasn't that they don't know how to do any to any routing. They made a calculated decision that to simplify the system would be worthwhile. Does that make if time permits, at some point, I'd like to at least briefly mention how BCP works, which is also a collection-oriented protocol. Uh, the main difference is that in BCP, you're not even maintaining a table. Each time you have to send a packet, you're kind of looking at queue state information uh, to your neighbors, and you make that dynamic decision. And we can talk a little bit about what the benefits of an approach where you don't even have to maintain a single best parent, but can sort of update that in real time uh, would be in. The short version is that if you have a lot of interference in the network, then instead of having a statically constructed dodag that you update periodically, uh, you're better off just having something where there is no s single best way to do it, but you kind of figure it out on the fly. So it's a little bit more responsive when there's interference. It's more robust. So uh, that's really all I wanted to say about RPL. Any questions? So one th um, thing about RPL is the metric that you use to choose the best parent is left open to the implementer. So they have uh, this idea they call, I think it's called image, no, it's just called OF, it's an objective function. Um, so if you look at, uh, let's briefly look at the RPL2 document. I might have some of these details. So the RPL2 document is the RFC for RPL. Has everybody seen an RFC before? Anybody here who's not seen an RFC before? Maybe that's a better question to ask. Okay, good. Um, so in uh, the RFC, you're really describing all the details of how RPL works, right? So if you look at, for example, um, if you're interested in finding out more about what those DIS, DIO, and DAO messages look like, what would be their format, all of that is described in here. They're SEMP, uh, v6 control messages, and it tells you what would go in each of those fields, uh, and what would be their fields, and so on. So if you look at, um, there's the section where they talk about the objective function. 3.2. Uh, it does talk about, yeah, 3.2.1 talks about that. So an objective function is basically how they choose uh, the parents as used, and uh, they translate whatever the metrics are of interest into the notion of rank, and uh, ultimately the rank is sort of helping you figure out your distance uh, from the root. Um, and they'd mention a few other RFCs which have more information about that, I thought even later in this document. So if you look at uh, section 14 as well, there's something about guidelines for objective functions. So in conjunction with routing metrics and constraints, allows for the selection of a dodag to join 
and a number of peers in that go die as partners, as parents, sorry. Uh, the objective function is used to compute an ordered list of parents and is responsible for computing the rank of the device within the version. Um, but it does at least kind of specify what, what are some things that the OF must specify. We had a student who was here uh, over the summer and he basically created a new objective function with the goal of creating more load balanced routing. So the goal was instead of finding the shortest path to the destination, what if I want to make sure that none of the nodes in the network are carrying more traffic than others? And that's a bigger concern when you're battery operated because one node's battery might die quicker than the others. And if you just blindly take the shortest path, it may over uh, utilize one node compared to the other. So you basically came up with an alternative objective function that tries to spread the traffic as much as possible and still stay reliable. So it's sort of to give you an intuition about why you might change it from just ETX. Machine learning? Was it like a machine learning process where it would learn? No, I mean, it was just using uh, some algorithmic mechanism yeah. that took into account how Delphi. much load each node had. You were just directly uh, measuring that, that amount, and that okay. was being used to determine what the metric on that link should be. Um, okay, so let's talk briefly about. Uh, Co-app, but let's take a break for about five, ten minutes. Uh, what we do is typically person-to-person -person communication, right? The standard internet that we've had for all these years is for email, it's for text, it's for sending uh, files, it's for browsing. All of these have a human at one endpoint, right? The other end might be a data store, but typically there's a human at some point. Um, with these devices, you can particularly, uh, you know, if you look at the whole ecosystem, you can have systems where there's no human in the loop anywhere, right? So your embedded devices are sensors, they're actuators, they're generating data, they can do something, and um, you can have at your servers, at your laptops, at your Android device, at the modes, computational processes that are running, that are filtering the information that they're getting, they're making decisions based on the information they're getting, and you're sort of walking around, but maybe the environments that you're walking around have the sensor tags embedded in them, so your phone's sort of talking to these sensors as you're moving around, and it's gathering information, or it's telling them what to do. Um, so you sort of have these new ways of interacting with the environment that you might have been used to. Right? So now, this is not about just everything has to go through a centralized infrastructure. It might be peer-to-peer. Um, you can implement protocols that are purely at the link layer, meaning they're just going over this radio and talking to what's nearby. It can be done at the uh, at, a, at a sort of IP layer where you uh, do something on top of UDP, for example, just socket-based. Or we can go even higher up and work above the application layer. And CoAP, for example, that you started to look at is an example of an application layer protocol. Published, uh, sort of you're closing the whole loop, right? So now you can build a distributed sensing and control system. That's really what the IoT is about, right? And that distributed system can be relatively small. It can be on the order of a few devices near you. It can be really large. It can be thousands of devices scattered all over the planet. Right? And knowing how to stitch together a heterogeneous network of that type using standard IP-based uh, mechanisms is sort of part of what that uh, whole space is about. So. Again, by way of sort of giving that, that high-level picture, and there's sort of a range of different mobility, uh, as I mentioned. So Android, for example, you could be on, uh, you have this Android phone with you. Subscribe is another class of application layer protocols. We'll talk about MQTT at some point in this course, and that's something else that people are starting to use to put together these systems. So you can have your devices communicate at the link layer, at, just above UDP, or above an application layer protocol. So those are sort of three places in which we typically uh, you know, build our systems, right? And of course, the network layer, which is in between that, so here, let's do this again. Uh, you notice I've left out the session and presentation. So you're sort of seeing a range of different devices. Uh, some of which are mobile, some of which are static, some of which are low power, some of which are plugged into the wall, 
some of which have batteries but can't last weeks. So there's sort of a range of different capabilities, range of different uh, types of uh, link layer technologies, um, you know, battery budgets, and so on. So this, really what this class is trying to do is expose you to all of these different uh, classes of things uh, and the technologies behind them, and then asking you to play and come up with something interesting. Right? Um, ultimately, really think about what can you do with these types of devices that you wouldn't just do traditionally. So traditionally, over the standard internet, uh, 